Dear colleagues, dear Esther Duflo, you're inaugurating today the annual chair Knowledge Against Poverty from Collège de France, which is a very original chair indeed. It was created on the initiative of our colleague Philippe Koeski, based on the idea that fighting against poverty requires lots of generosity, but also funding but that this is not sufficient. The large diversity of stakeholders, the large diversity of interest, the necessary respect of men and culture have made of this field one of the most complex that can exist. We need and mobilize various knowledge to understand the issues and then adapt to the various fields. In short, it is essential we develop a science to act in the field, to structure, to share and teach knowledge. Thanks to a major expert at international level, this chair will help us address various aspects such as access to natural resources, development of cities, health-related issues and development economy. This international chair benefits by the support of the French Development Agency chaired by Michel Severino and Pierre Jacquet. Partnership between AFD and Collège de France provides this chair with sufficient means to organize international conferences to provide teaching through the internet and broadcast an English translation of all the lectures. AFD also contributes its expertise on various development issues. Then, thanks to a cooperation with the University Agency of French-speaking countries, directed by Serge Frank Agrini, this inaugural lecture is broadcasted to many of the digital campuses working with the agency. It will be followed in Rabat, in Bamako, Yaoundé, Sofia, and Tananarivo, so that professors, people like you, will be able to answer to the questions of development stakeholders in the field. Esther Duflo, you could not be a better choice for the Collège de France as the first holder of this chair. You have a remarkable career because after your thesis in economy, you were appointed a professor of economy and poverty uh, and fight against poverty in the MIT. Your research is based on a very simple idea, the idea according to which rigorous and simple evaluation is required to assess the efficiency of a strategy in the field of education, health, and microcredit. In that field, the laboratory called Action Against Poverty that you set up in, with an MIT uses an experimental method close to the randomized studies that we use in clinical studies. And this is a methodology you're implementing in various countries like India, Bolivia, and many others. You also wish to share and disseminate your knowledge in order to have an impact on public policies. So you're with us for one year 
to share your experience with us and to share with us this conviction which is yours, i.e. that fighting against poverty must be based on objective elements which will be the basis of the various strategies which will have to be implemented. Thank you very much. Mr. Administrator, dear colleagues, dear friend, in 2005, 1.4 billion people lived with less than a dollar per day. Each year, at least 27 million children don't get basic vaccinations. 536,000 women die in childbirth and more than 6.5 million children don't even reach the age of one. More than half children attending school in India at the moment can't even read a paragraph. Given the magnitude, complexity and shock provoked by such situations, we could either just think it's too big of an endeavor or offer radical solutions and promise the end again. Uh, the end of poverty. With this chair, this year, I'd like to offer a third alternative, which is ambitious, but also aware of its limits. We do not have the key to put an end to poverty, but it's possible to fight better against poverty. Knowledge has a role to play in this endeavor. It must help us suggest solutions and assess the relevance of our policies. I'm going to try and show the possible role of economy in fighting against poverty by presenting the experimental methods in development economy. This approach favors creative experiment, experiments and is based on the principle according to which it's, it's possible to improve economic policies by trying new approaches and learning from their success and failures. New ideas and solutions are assessed in the field. By doing so, we learn about policies which are efficient, those which are not, and therefore we understand better the fundamental processes which are at the origin of poverty. Therefore, science and poverty can strengthen each other. When we talk about development, very often arguments tend to be close to caricature. I.e. Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Institute of Earth in the U University of Columbia, thinks that poverty could be eradicated if rich countries accept it to triple their aid to developing countries, uh, move, shifting it from $65 billion in 2002 to $195 billion in 2015. According to him, poor countries are in a poverty trap because of various factors such as climate, diseases, but targeted actions could help these countries to get out from this trap. For others, like William Easterly, uh, the economic aid cannot solve the problem. And in his book called The Burden of White Men, William Easterly denounces the industry of development aid. For William Easterly, the only way to combat poverty is to organize sustainable growth. He recognizes we do not have the key to put an end to poverty, but he offers a solution, freedom, market, and democracy. And using the arguments of Hayek and Friedman, explains that market and competition are the only ways to guarantee prosperity of everyone on the long term. Any attempt to force this process would only lead to its failure. Jeffrey Sachs and, and well, Easterly are not the only ones having discovered the end of, to poverty. There is the Copenhagen consensus, the proposals by Paul Collier, etc., etc. All these experts are s sometimes opposing each other, but they all have a passion and they have another thing in common. They all claim a scientific approach which is univocal and admits no complexity nor doubt. This trend to become to, to be very biased is not new. Churchill was making fun about economists. He was saying if I ask uh, a question to five economists, I get f six answers, four from the two from the first ones and and four from Keynes. 
But as this is an issue of which we have no direct experience, people expect a legitimate argument from experts, and they don't want to have and the tendency to obtain uh, univocal comments on issues like poverty is quite common, but it's also misleading. We can re we can say that large international journals, having insisted too much on the accuracy of details, have missed out the forest by focusing just on the tree. We also admit that when the project is huge, the, solution, the solutions have to be huge as well. And it's always easier to identify large solutions than smaller ones, the relevance of which would have been demonstrated. So how can we identify the issues? Usually experts all use the same database, a database covering 100, uh, 200 countries, including GDP figures and figures about the population, type of diseases, etc. And based on this model, they try and establish a statistical model to explain the level of wealth or growth of a country. And Bill Easterly shows in his works that external aid is not correlated to a larger growth in each country. And he contradicts a paper issued by experts in the World Bank that demonstrated exactly the opposite. Another example, Jeff Sachs, shows that countries uh, where there are um, diseases, are usually uh, major tr tropical diseases, are usually the poorest countries. That contradicts another paper that shows that those countries who have eradicated uh, infectious diseases in the 50s have not grown faster, uh, faster than others. So we realize that through these statistical uh, methodologies, it's very difficult to explain economic growth. Two variables can be cause and effect, or two variables can be explained by a third one. Yes, countries suffering uh, diseases are poorer, but maybe these countries suffer uh, another series of evil and plague, and maybe it's the institution, political institutions of these countries which are responsible for poverty. So if institutions are bad in these countries, maybe it's because these countries are poor. So that's... It, that's a, a finished circle. So to put an end to this loop, we could use the historical ac the accidents in history to explain why some countries have a better progression than others. And some scientists show that some countries like Congo became extraction colonies which still have dysfunctional institutions and uh, are still poor. But what was this due to? Because of, of infectious diseases. So the loop is back to square one. So with just one database of countries, we will not be able to find the answer. Even if we were convinced that economic growth was a secret to fight against poverty, looking back in the past would only would not be a fruitful approach. So should we just resort, as Billy Sterling offers, resort to 7 billion experts to sort out the problem. Well, this is something I don't think. By focusing too much on the overall problem of uh, poverty eradication, we lost sight of the key question, the one that motivates all our works. How can we make sure that a billion people living with less than a dollar per day can live better if researchers now try and focus on more modest objectives? How can human sciences and how can economy support policies and help fight against poverty. We'll talk about poverty here in the large sense of the world. Poverty is not just an economic issue, but it's also lack of access to education, health, etc. In my work, I suggest that economy could be guiding within a creative experimental process to experiment policies to fight 
against the various components of poverty. In 1932, Roosevelt, who is back on the agenda today with the new crisis, but Roosevelt used to say the country needs Fighting against poverty, the answer to a permanent crisis, policy, economic policy needs imagination. When it lacks imagination very often, politicians are not exempt to look for absolute solution, a bit like researchers. The impossibility for them to admit failure or has many hindrances to social innovation. Fighting against poverty requires experiments in both ends of the word. On the one hand, we need and test new approaches, but we also need to take the opportunity to learn from our mistakes. And for this, experimentation should not just be a very small experiment, but it has to be carried out as a scientific experiment. Scientists can contribute to this process for two reasons. First, because they have a small area of expertise in which they can suggest or identify new solutions and come up with suggestions. And on the other hand, because they have the expertise to help assess programs in a very, very rigorous manner and then turn experiment into something really and genuinely scientific. I will now discuss on these two points uh, more in depth. So I do believe that economics can contribute to social innovation, but there is a positivist tradition in economy which is traditionally linked to the uh, School of Chicago. E the economic agent is a billiard ball and the economist is an observer looking at the ball. So like a physicist needs to look at the billiard ball to understand the law of uh, uh, of uh, billiards and the f laws of physics entail, economists need to look at this to infer the law of economy. Now, if the economist was to replace the economic agent, he would only make things worse. The principle is expressed in the, the very if in the in the common sentence that says there is no banknote on the pavement, if if banknotes could uh, do better, if pavements could do better, they would have done it already. In development economy, this vision was articulated in the 60s by Ted Schultz, who was creating the modern uh, development economy. He used the example of farmers in Guatemala, who showed that these are poor yet efficient farmers, i.e. they use the uh, resources available to them at their best, and we have nothing to that we can teach them. So this argument in favor of positivist economy is based on a misleading idea because the mistake is to see economic agents as scientists. In reality, economic decisions that we make on a daily basis are close to the work of a craftsman and they can be improved by experience and expertise. And like a craftsman can benefit by expertise in their field, likewise, economic agent can benefit from expertise in their field. One interesting example to study this, even in a field in which people have been working for a very long time, is the example chosen by Schultz and Sachs, which is that of farmers, which seeds should be used, which fertilizers should be used, etc., etc. Such. Another reason why this is interesting is because that corresponds to an ideological fracture line uh, between Billy Stoney and Jeff Sachs. In the 60s and the 70s, all developing countries had uh, significant subsidies for using fertilizers. The School of Chicago considers that uh, subsidizing the use of fertilizers is damageable. Farmers should not use fertilizers if the increase in farm produ production 
uh, is below the manufacturing cost. So if we subsidize fertilizers, we only subsidize overuse of fertilizers, which is damaging both for the economy and the environment. International institutions like the World Bank were more on the Chicago School side, but more recently, the positive experiment of countries like Malawi that reintroduced uh, uh, farm subsidies has uh, sort of changed the balance that the a cornerstone of Jeff Sachs' program to eradicate poverty, and there is a big debate going on at the moment. The reasoning of the School of Chicago, according to which if fertilizers were profitable, they would be used, requires that farmers know exactly the effect of fertilizers, but farmers lack time and time to experiment because each season is vital for them. So if the technology they use already is satisfying, there is no chance they will use another one. If there is one risk, this new approach is not more profitable. Of course, they can look at what their neighbors are doing and try and copy what their neighbors are doing. But if that's the case, that reduces encouragement to innovation because it's always possible to benefit from the experience of others. And therefore, other scientists have shown in their work on hybrid cultures in India, they've shown that although each farmer works in a very uh, rational way, innovation is not sufficient for each person Even if we can say that each person is rational, we cannot say that all farmers are more efficient. In working with John Robinson and Michael Kremer on the use of fertilizer, we even show that there are situations in which the possibility to learn from your neighbor disappears when innovation is not active enough. In this type of environment, technological progress can be very slow. Therefore, This is where experts can play a role, agricultural experts, experts who know about the use of fertilizers and who can teach farmers how to use fertilizers in their field. If social learning no longer plays its role, then we might need a more comprehensive initiative like distribution of fertilizer, like in Malawi, with the presence of experts. This is an example in which we see the need of experts, the need to resort to experts, is still very much present, even for all uh, technologies like the use of fertilizers in farming. But this is not an area where you need economists. Let me now mention an area where the role of economists can be very profitable. Still talking about fertilizers. School of Chicago says that if fertilizers were profitable and farmers knew about it, they would use us, use fertilizers. But in Kenya, we carried out works that show that even if farmers know that fertilizers are useful, they don't necessarily use them. 20 to 30 percent farmers use fertilizers every year, although they recognize their They're useful. And farmers tell us that the reason why they don't use fertilizers is because each year they plan to use fertilizers, but the day they need to buy fertilizers, they no longer have the money available. And the system is as follows. They have money after the crops, but they spend more money than they plan between the crops and the moment they have to, to buy fertilizers. And when the time comes to buy fertilizer, they have no money because they've used it to buy food. That this system uh, reminds us of the uh, attitude and behavior of American people who always plan to save for their pension and never do that. Or that uh, and this type of behavior has been explained We say that this world is impatient, wants to make the most out of life right now. And when we think about the future, we think about the future with our brain. We know that if we uh, smoke until the age of 50, we will die at the age of 60 from lung cancer. So we'd like to quit smoking, but just after the last cigarette. Thanks to medical imaging, new 
works have shown that different areas in the brain are activated whether we think about the immediate present and this is where the emotional areas in the brain is activated but when we think about the future it's the other part of the brain the one that makes calculations for the future which is activated so let's come back to our farmers in Kenya they've uh, uh, collected their crop they have money they know they will need it in the future but this is just in the future so they postpone it But before the moment they need to buy fertilizers arrives, other emergencies have popped up and the money has been used otherwise. So we make better, we would make better economic decisions if we could make them today and make sure that we stick to these decisions in the future like Ulysses, who made a decision to avoid uh, going with the mermaid. A smoker who cannot quit smoking would like the government to make cigarettes illegal as from next year. Likewise, farmers who have um, earned money from their crops would like to be forced to use this money to buy fertilizers in the future. So one way of doing that would be be to motivate them to buy fertilizers just when they've sold their crops by give them, giving them an incentive, for instance, a reduction on the price of fertilizer if they buy it immediately after they've sold their crops, or free delivery uh, to those who choose to buy it immediately after their crops. We've tested this and we've implemented such a program which we compared to another more traditional uh, program consisting in offering a 50% rebate on the price of fertilizers, but this at the time where fertilizers are needed. See the fraction of people who decide to buy the uh, fertilizers uh, at the time of the crops and at the time of when it's needed. So you see the control group at 30%, the SAFI group. You see that we move from 30% to 51% adoption rate with a very small uh, reduction because the delivery uh, cost is very small. And in the middle, we have 43%, and that's the 50% rebate on the cost of fertilizers. That underlines the importance of the moment when decisions are made. This solution is a way to escape the sterile argument of whether we're pro or against subsidies. A very small subsidy has an impact And it shows that the expertise of economists is not always useless. It's because we studied economic agents that we came up with this model and this solution. This example of using fertilizers also illustrates that we need to have another a different position from that of the School of Chicago, which says that if there was a, such a thing as a good solution, it would, it would have been identified already. And the uh, example in that field is invention of microcredit. After the failure of large uh, credit programs, the 70s and in the 70s and in the 80s, we were all very pessimistic with regards to the capacity of lending money to poor people. We thought, well, they have no money to pay back, so it's just impossible for these people to take a loan. Mr. Yunus, Mohammed Yunus, refused this uh, argument and set up an institution to lend money to very poor people. It took lots of years of experiments, but it's based on social capital, dynamic incentives, regular meeting, and high interest rates, even though they're lower than th those offered by loan sharks. So, but this is, uh, I'm not going to 
uh, say here whether this institution is appropriate and relevant or not. This is something we'll do in my lecture on microcredit. But all I'm saying here is that this is possible. We cannot consider that everything has been invented and there is still a lot to do. However, economists can get it wrong and they often get it wrong. To analyze a problem, they need and simplify reality in order to, mod to modelize reality and therefore they may ignore important elements. For some of them, they're aware of the fact that easy solutions can be very damageful. Uh, they use it as an argument not to do anything. But economists are not the only ones to get it wrong. We've, in economy, we very go from one f fashion to another. Bill is Easterly is very angry about the enthusiasm of technocrats moving from one fashion to another. But uh, national governments also make these mistakes. New governments introduce new programs. No lesson is learned. People in favor of the government are happy about the success. Opponents Opponents uh, criticize the failures, etc. So as Roosevelt said, if it fails, um, admit it frankly. We need from observing the fact that we cannot prove a policy is inefficient and be, it's very close to being very pessimistic and cynical, but it gives a justification to citizens in rich countries to oppose redistribution of wealth. It's very comfortable to say that the funds to fight against poverty would be wasted, and therefore this is an argument to keep money for yourself. But this cannot, conversely, this can not also be used to increase budget, because if aid free development is indispensable. Why isn't it more general? One hypothesis is that assessment is not widespread because nobody wants assessment. For partisan of a program, it's key to show the success of a program because this is on the success that they can be re-elected, that the program can continue, etc. So there is an overall tendency to overestimate the success Everybody knows that, and when I say everybody, it's citizens, the uh, donors, etc. But learning from experience in such an, ex an environment becomes impossible. There must be things true in this description. I very often had to confront uh, situations in which it was very difficult to obtain real results, but. I think that most programs are not assessed because it's just difficult also to assess an impact. What does assessment mean? Social policies are not sanctioned by consumers. Social policies and policy to fight poverty is needed when market has failed. For instance, you can decide to subsidize education because as a society we feel it's important that children are educated even when parents cannot afford schooling. But once you've decided to subsidize education, this can be done in different ways. We can decide and subsidize private schooling, we can build schools, we can give money to municipalities so that they build schools, etc., etc. But even if, but all these choices have an impact on the quality of education. But even if options are not the good ones, and even if the quality of education is weak, poor children have to do with what they're given, because that's their only option, because this is why the government decided to intervene. It's only in extreme situations in which the 
policies are so poor that the provided service no longer has any value that people just move away from public services. For instance, in India, where there is a de facto privatization of public health, when families no longer expect expect anything from public services, you can say that you've spent your money for nothing. But apart from these extreme situations, how can we make sure pu public policies have an impact? Well, two things here. One, we need to make sure that this policy has actually been implemented. Has policy been implemented? Has the money been spent appropriately? But then, if the policy has been implemented, did it yield the expected results or other results? And this is what we call impact assessment. But impact assessment is something difficult because we want to compare the situation of people exposed to a program to the situation they would have experienced if they'd not been uh, exposed to the program. But we cannot observe the same person in the two situations. So the great difficulty is to build an appropriate control group. I'd like to share an example with you with regards to gender equality in policy. More than 100 countries have established rules to guarantee the uh, representation of women in politics at all levels. So the first assessment is to see if a larger number of women have been elected. Second question, which is a bit more difficult, is as follows. Does the presence of women have an impact on the policies implemented and or on the image of women as political leaders? Which are probably the two things that we want to impact by introducing more women in politics. But this is difficult because those villages having a female mayor are probably less biased against women and probably have different priorities. So if you compare women having women as mayor to those having men as mayors, we will capture the impact of having a female mayor and all pre-existing differences. So this difficulty is at the heart of assessment. So it's difficult to assess the impact of a program with accuracy because that there is a bias linked to, linked to selection. So how can we sort out this problem? Traditional economy uses statistical models such as regression and matching to, cap to compute differences between the test group and the control group. But the problem is that we're never certain we have captured all the variables to carry out the control. And in an environment like the one I described earlier, in which you have a tendency to overestimate results, this issue is increased with another problem. Different techniques can yield different results. So if you can choose the technique, then the selection bias is amplified by what I call a drawer bias, so that, meaning that the bad results are left in a drawer. More recently, economists have developed a series of methods to be able to compare various situations. For instance, in the case of women, we could say we compare cities in which a list led by a woman has won a very short majority to a city in which the list led by a woman has lost by a very short number of votes. So we could compare, because that means that the population in the villages are very comparable. This method has been used on a certain number of prog programs, but the problem is it's not always possible to establish such groups. The natural experiment method is very often criticized. Researchers can only assess what they can assess and not necessarily what they want to assess. So another solution consists in not waiting for the ideal conditions to, to exist, but to carry out experiment. That's the experimental methodology that brings together people in the field and researchers right at the very beginning of the program. So a task group is selected, groups, Committed to different 
programs are strictly comparable. So that helps determining the impact of the programs in a very clear way by ass assessing the results of the test group to those of the control group. This is possible for pilot programs which are, by definition, small scale and being studied. It's also possible to achieve when you work with an NGO on small scale and low budget projects. And when the randomized testing of a test group versus a control group is regarded as the best way to assess a program. This is what we did to assess gender equality in India. In recently, a law in India says that one third of women on the municipal council had to, one third members of municipal councils had to be members, had to be women. We selected villages in which the only candidate to the post of mayor could be a woman. We collected data to assess, one, the impact of female mayors on the type of decisions made by municipal councils. And what we identified here, what we discovered, is that it did make a big difference to have a female mayor as opposed to a male mayor and female mayors would make decisions more in favor of women in their constituency. For instance, investment on uh, drinkable water in red. These are the villages where the mayor has to be a woman by law, and in blue, very few female mayors because the law doesn't make it mandatory for mayors to be female. And you see in Bengal and Rajasthan, you see the significant differences in investing on drinkable water networks uh, f between the different types of villages. Second question, having a female mayor, does it have an impact on the image of uh, uh, female leaders? This quota method could have a very negative impact on citizens, and if women but conversely, this could be an opportunity for female to show their value. So now the difficulty is to measure all this. If you ask a question to people, there is a great chance their answer will be influenced by the image they want to give of themselves or by their reaction about the quota policies. So we decided to ask vill villagers to listen to the same speech pronounced either by a man or a woman. And then we ask them to assess the speech. And based on the differences, we see the level of discrimination against women. So I'll show you the results now. Here, you have the difference in judgment after people listen to a speech pronounced by a woman and by a man, in blue for male and in yellow for women. You see that blue answers in villages non reserved to women mayor. So these women, these people think the speech has less value if it's pronounced by a woman. In red, it, these are for the villages in which the woman had to be a in which the mayor had to be a woman by law. And you see that for men there is uh, no inversion, but there is a progress. And that has a very significant political impact. Here are the results of the 2008 elections for seats which are not reserved for, to women. You see that on the far left, we get the results for those villages that have never been reserved to women, to women mayors. In blue, for those villages which had to have a female mayor just once. And on the far right, that's for villages who have had to have a female mayor two times. Random assessment is was unknown 10 years ago, but it's more common today. In the Poverty Action Lab, or which I manage, 
we have a hundred ongoing uh, projects. The World Bank, the AFD, the MCC now support randomized evaluations. The first generation of program evaluation and development were very simple uh, programs that were just trying to determine what works. And a series of works have uh, tried to evaluate the impact of various programs beyond results. These experiments have shown the key value of experimental approach. It allows to evaluate a program, but then by working very close with the organization in the field, it also allows to test theory for field workers working with researchers. They can express why they think a project or a program is efficient, and then researchers can use this information to better assess the program, to understand if the program has the uh, impact, the, the expected impact. For researchers working with people in the field, help them working as assessors, but also as code organizers of the, program, of the program and assess the experiment, then ask new questions, then think about the program to come up with new experiments. One example, coming back to the example of fertilizers. This is an example in which this back and forth program was carried out between 2001 and 2006 within the same research program. The first interventions aimed at exploring the way people learn through action. So what we did was we showed farmers how they could use fertilizers in their own fields on very small plots of land uh, selected at random. So they had their own randomized experiment. And after they realized that using fertilizers was increasing their productivity, we noticed that farmers would use fertilizers more on the following year. But we also assessed the strength of the social network. So would friends of pilot farmers, would they use fertilizers more than those in the control group? Well, you see pilot farmers, 32%. Control group, 17%. But the friends of pilot farmers also used the uh, fertilizers at the same level of control farmers. So what does it mean? Does it mean that it's impossible to learn from the, your neighbor's experience? So what we did to answer to this question, we invited friends of these pilot firm, farmers to take part in the major phases of the experience. And when the friends are invited, then they use the fertilizers just as much as pilot farmers. So. It is possible to learn from the experience carried out in your neighbor's field. And if there is no network effect, it's because farmers don't talk about agriculture in that context. So this is something that we went to check by asking people very simple questions about their farming practices and about that of their neighbors. And we realized that the farmers don't know what their neighbors are doing. These results are surprising and are in contrast with those of Sachs I mentioned earlier. So we constructed an epidemiologic simple model of social interaction. Social interaction it needs to be disseminated and it only survives if it's disseminated. So there can be a virtue circle like the green one where people talk and innovation survive because they're disseminated. Hence, there is a lot of innovation and it's worth talking to your neighbor and people talk to each other. But there could, could be a vicious circle where people don't talk. So innovations don't survive. Hence, there is a decrease in, in innovation leading to people not talking and discussing. This led to the elaboration of an empirical model that we're going to test next summer. Now, if this theoretical framework that helps experiment to strengthen mutually and which helps growth to uh, 
uh, knowledge to grow. We can also say that the results of one experiment cannot necessarily be reproduced. This is very often what is used to criticize random experiment because what's useful in Kenya is not necessarily useful in India. That's the effect of context. Of course it's true, yet no consistent social uh, policy would be possible if there was not a certain continuum between individuals. So the impact of a program can vary from one individual to another, but the impact of one program can help us identify which program could be relevant. And we can then test this program in a different context or slightly different programs in a similar context. And this is reflected by another Example, still talking about Jeff Sachs and Bill Eastring. Should we distribute mosquito nets impregnated with insect repellent? Because these are regarded as one of the most efficient methods to fight against malaria at the moment. As mosquito nets have a positive impact, because if if mosquitoes cannot uh, suck the blood of people, they go elsewhere, it seems good common sense to subsidize these mosquito nets. And if you want to have a large number of mosquito nets, they need to be subsidized. But in social marketing, in the literature, it is said that the price cannot be zero. It has to be low, but there has to be a cost. And these arguments are used by Bill Easterling in his book. Why? There is a selection effect. If mosquito nets are for free, there will be waste because those who don't need it will take them. And there is a psychological effect as well. Paying for something makes it more precious. So those who paid for a mosquito nest would more probably use them. To test, so that was an empirical question. There were arguments both in, in... in favor or against this uh, this statement. So two scientists, two economists, have designed a very simple experiment. They have subsidized mosquito nets, but at different levels, in two, in different uh, maternity wards in Kenya. In some clinics, they were given for free. In others, they were sold at a, che- at a cheap price. So... The first result is that people are very sensitive to price. When mosquito nets are for free, 200 mosquito nets are distributed per month and 40 when they have to be paid for, knowing that the cost was very, very low indeed because it was $1 per mosquito net. So, second result the probability of using the mosquito nets, and this is something that uh, researchers checked by visiting the families, and it's not related with the price families had to pay for the mosquito net. So, from a cost-benefit ratio standpoint, it's more beneficial to give these mosquito nets for free. Midover, who is... uh, an economist who is in favor of positive prices protests and says that these results are specific to pregnant women and specific to Kenya because social marketing had been present in Kenya for quite a long time. So these fast results led him to fine-tuning his theory. I think he used to say... Okay, mosquito nets have to be paid for everywhere, but in Kenya, but with pregnant women in Kenya. But this can be tested because this experiment has been tested uh, on different markets, on both men and women, and replicas were carried out in Madagascar and Uganda, and the same findings were identified. Yet it doesn't mean that the answer is going to be valid everywhere for all types of countries, but this invalidates a a widespread theory. So experiment is directly useful, and the social marketing organization that distributes mosquito nets in Kenya has now decided to give them out for free in all maternity wards in Kenya. But beyond that, we also learned something about theory. So 
field experiment are a means to test theory. And in my opinion, they're the best way to test a theory. We've seen that we need uh, various theories which are difficult to, to test. In theoretical economy, very often empirical models need to be reasonable and sensible. And when results, what does reasonable mean? Re reasonable means that results have to be consistent with expectations. But when results are very remote from expectations, then maybe it's not theory which is wrong, but the assumptions. The first conclusion of publishers w will be to consider that the study is not good. In retrospect, that gives the study a way to find a consensus. The more the study comes to comfort already known results, the more it will have a possibility to get published. But if the experiment has been carried out properly, the results are there. It doesn't matter if your th theory is nice when the results are wrong. Laboratory experiments also have a this characteristic. They use voluntary people, students, and ask them to test things in a controlled environment. The laboratory offers more flexibility than field experiments because in, when you carry out field experiments, you have a constraint. So you are dealing with real people in real conditions and you can't harm these people. But in a laboratory, you have more flexibility, which is at the expense of the results. The way a student is going to use five dollars doesn't teach us a lot with regards to how people behave in real life. Anomalies identified in laboratories are not often taken into account by the rest of economists with this type of arguments. Field experiment do not have such a problem. So they have a subversive effect, which retrospect or laboratory experiments don't have. And this is their major strength. And that's an opportunity to help science move forward and help fight against poverty, make one step forward. By focusing on creative experiment, we do not abandon our objective to reduce poverty in a significant way one day. Quite the opposite, having specific interventions on fighting against corruption, on health and education is a key step forward to increase wealth for a large number of people, and this for three reasons. One, very simple, is that to be in a good health, you need to be alive. And to be wealthy, you need to be alive. There is a joke by Keynes, which is very often quoted. In the long run, we will all be dead. But this is unfortunately very much true for the three million children who die from diseases that could have been prevented through vaccinations. What will be the good of economic growth to these children if they're no longer alive to benefit from this ben from this economic growth. A well-fed, well-educated population will most probably be in a better position to benefit from economic growth. A second reason is a political reason. The end of the quote by Roosevelt is as follows. The millions who are in want will not remain silent forever when the things to satisfy their needs are within easy reach. And this is something that we've seen in many environments. In Brazil, after Brazil experienced uh, a huge, a tremendous growth in the 70s, it uh, ended up in populism in the 80s, and it took a Lula to come back to positive growth. In India, works by Banerjee and Piketty reveal a tremendous increase in huge fortunes. It's true that poverty is also regressing, but the quality of public services is is is, uh, is catastrophic. And the slogan "India shining" no longer meets the expectation of uh, middle classes. The government 
has decided to put money in basic public services, but despite their political will, uh, it's quite probable they won't be able to do better than the former government in their mission in favor of health in rural areas. Funds have been tripled, but this financial effort has not been accompanied by any effort to reform the health system, which many poor people are very suspicious about. And this money spent in this dying system will have a very small impact, and therefore the uh, opponents will be in a very good position to claim that taxpayers' money has been misspent. Economic growth is essential, but will only be possible if wealth is well distributed. And to achieve that, we need political will and the capability of implementing efficient policies. And to achieve that, we need experiments. And microeconomic experiments are probably the key to better understand macroeconomic phenomena, which and could help eradicate poverty. We've seen that using macroeconomic factors to understand the uh, mechanics of, of poverty lead to a dead end. Yet it doesn't mean we should not try and identify these, but we should do otherwise. We've seen that randomized experiments help us test and understand economic models. But in that frame, framework, they can also help us identify parameters which can be used in macroeconomic models, like we would use uh, small bricks to build a bigger model, which can then be used to design policies. But the more the microeconomics will be assessed, the more macroeconomic model will meet a real necessity in reality. So this back and forth movement between micro and macroeconomics will definitely make a difference with regards to eradicating and fighting against poverty. This approach is still at its very beginning, but it looks very promising to me. In conclusion, I want to practice economy as a human science, rigorous, serious science, but also human science, recognizing the complexity of human being. Science which is humble, recognizing its mistakes, but very much committed. It is a great honor for me to be able to share this passion of mine with Collège de France this year. Thank you very much for your attention.